Good evening. Welcome to Trinity University and the Distinguished Science Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Fred Loxham. I'm in the I mean, academic affairs for another month. Uh, and <laughs> and um, I have a great, the great pleasure of welcoming you to this uh, series and particularly to this lecture tonight. Uh, as you know, um, our lecturer is Tyrone B. Hayes, and he will fairly shortly be giving a presentation, uh, but I wanted to just tell you kind of how it, the events are gonna go. Uh, after i done, which will be shortly, uh, uh, a Trinity student will introduce uh, Dr. Hayes, and, um, and then after his talk, which will be fascinating, uh, you're welcome to stay, and if you have questions, and if, uh, uh, today's uh, events have been any uh, ind indicator. You you will have questions. Uh, you'll be excited about some things. You can come up to these microphones and take turns using these microphones. Um, so first, I want to mention that this lecture is uh, made possible by the Walter F. Brown uh, family, and they support the uh, uh, presentation in the whole series, and. Uh, I want, if there's a member of the Brown family here, I want you to know we've made good use of your funds. Uh, today, uh, Tyrone has been working very hard. He uh, met early with a group of faculty, he had lunch with a group of students, and then he had a long, interesting uh, discussion, uh, reception with a group of students. By the way, he said working with the students was the best part of uh, the, the, the day so far. Um, before he met you all, that's going to be. Um, so, he's, so his heart is in the right place. His students are wonderful. That's why we're here. That's why, we're, that's why we have the university. Um, and then he gave a biology seminar and a reception for faculty. So he's done roughly, by faculty standards, uh, two or three days worth of work today, and he's done a great job, and we, and we appreciate it uh, a great deal. Um, 
So he'll be, he'll be here shortly, but as a treat, uh, we've asked a uh, Trinity student, Gabby uh, Mudokunye, to introduce Professor Hayes. Uh, Gabby is a junior biology major from Dallas. She spent her er early years in Zimbabwe. She does research on the function of proteins and epithelial cells. Uh, and she's certainly a scientist and a good one, uh, and, but she's also an active member of uh, several different Trinity organizations, including working as a resident assistant. She's a, a, a wonderful student. We're proud of her, uh, and I want to give her the opportunity to introduce Dr. Hayes. So, Gabby, please. Hello. Um, I hope you're all having a good Monday night. Um, I'm super honored to have this opportunity to introduce Dr. Hayes. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about him, and then we can listen to his talk. Uh, so Dr. Hayes was born on July 29, 1967, um, in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, he's always been interested in studying animals. Uh, actually, at his grandma's house, he was always seen outside in the swamps um, looking at the animals. And he continued his passion for sciences throughout high school and pursued his undergraduate degree at Harvard University um, in 1989. He then completed his PhD in only three and a half years um, from the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of California, Berkeley um, in 1993. And he uh, attributes his decision to receive a PhD by the mentorship of Bruce Waldman and his now wife, Kathy Kim. Dr. Hayes then became an assistant professor at UC Berkeley and became the second youngest tenured professor um, in his department's history in 2003. Uh, he's published 20 papers on the endocrinology of amphibians, and he's heavily interested in how chemicals disrupt the environment. Specifically, he's been involved in researching the effects of atrazine. Um, it's a herbicide. Uh, the effects of atrazine on the African clawed frog uh, for the company Syngenta. And he discovered that atrazine was toxic for the frogs and decided um, and was severely affecting their sexual reproduction. And Dr. Hayes stood by his research, um, and he continued uh, to study atrazine even after he stopped receiving funding from Syngenta. So that's extremely noble of him. Um, and he's advocated for the ban of, on atrazine due to its negative side effects. His advocacy has gained tons of attention. Um, he has multiple documentaries, such as What's Motivating Hayes and The Silence of the Lambs. And, um, being a person of color um, in a field that doesn't have a lot of people of color, uh, Dr. Hayes is an advocate for student inclusion and diversity at Berkeley, and he has been active in the Berkeley NSF REU, which is the Research Experience for Undergraduates program. Um, he's also raised issues of environmental racism. Um, a quote from him, he warns that the consequences of atrazine use are disproportionately felt by people of color. Hayes has said that ethnic minorities are more likely to live or work in areas um, where they're exposed to pesticides. And when Dr. Hayes is not researching he, um, and advocating for environmental safety, he enjoys spending time with his family, um, gardening, and working outside. And we are very excited to have Dr. Hayes here. Um, he's a great example of what it means uh, to stick to your word. And so if you would all join me in welcoming Dr. Tyrone Hayes. Well, let me just get set up here. My, my introducers know more about me than I do. All that's out there somewhere. So, first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation. I want to thank you for coming out. I want to thank you for your time and spending this time with me tonight. Um, I'm going to tell you a story. From Silent Spring to Silent Night, A Tale of Toads and Men. I'll explain the title. But before I tell my story, I never introduce myself or my work without thanking the people who made me who I am. This is a proverb that I learned while working in Zimbabwe and South Africa. I always open with this. And certainly with Gabby in the audience, I'm not going to try to pronounce the Zulu or the Glosa. <laughs> but loosely translated, it means people are people through other people. And so as a result of, 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 of believing in, in this, um, 
as I said, I never introduce myself or my work without introducing the people who make me who I am. Um, first and foremost, my family. This is my family back in South Carolina. It's an old picture. They won't let me be in them anymore. You can guess why. <laughs> but I would be nothing without these people in my life. My mother and my father, Romeo and Susie Hayes. I'm a biologist, so literally I would not be here without these individuals, and certainly without their love and support, these last 50 years would, would not have been bearable. I want to thank my wife, Catherine Kim, for her love and support over the last 30 years. And also, again, as a biologist, these two would not be here if it wasn't for her. It's my, oops, my son, Tyler Casey Kim Hayes, my daughter, Casina Simone Kim Hayes. And I show this, this is also an older picture. I show this, it's, it's actually their prom pictures from high school. And, and I show them because I, I don't know which made me prouder that my son borrowed my tie for his prom or that my daughter borrowed my earrings for her prom. It was, <laughs> a, it was a proud dad moment, you know. After eight years of being told, no, daddy's earrings are too grown up for you, she finally got to wear my earrings. And she's going to kill me if she knows. In fact, I'm giving a talk at her college in, in a couple of months. I'm going to make sure and still use that slide. I want to thank my funding. It takes money to do work. Um, I also want to point out as disclosure, I've been funded by the agrochemical industry. Um, but, but not anymore. So, so, some, somebody once said, and pardon my language, I know there's some young ones in the audience, but somebody once said, if you're not pissing anybody off, maybe you're not doing anything important. By that standard, I'm pretty important. <laughs> I also want to thank the students that have been involved in my work, and I want to point out that everybody in blue is an undergraduate. I had a wonderful experience as an undergraduate myself. It's the reason that I got out in those three and a half years. And I've been doing my best to try to give that back to these guys now that I'm in a position to do so. This is a more recent list of my students. And, and this is an old photograph. There was one guy in the lab at the time. He didn't show up for the photograph. But I've had this wonderful experience of working with a wonderful diversity of people, not just ethnicities and first gen and low income, but a number of the individuals you see in this photograph grew up in families that were migrant farm workers and working in the agri-industry. And it gives me a, an entirely different perspective on, on what my work means and what things mean. And I'm very appreciative of that. And finally, I want to dedicate, you heard about her already, my grandmother, who was like a third parent to me. I want to dedicate, as I do every time I'm invited anywhere, this to my grandmother. She not only taught me, passed on to me before she passed on, her love of education and her desire to make the world a better place. But she also taught me something that you can't learn in places like Harvard and Berkeley. She taught me that if you want to get a good point across, don't teach, don't preach, don't give a talk. Just tell a good story. And so I'm just here today to tell you a story. And my story will start and end with a little boy who likes frogs. I got about 50 minutes and I got 50 years, so it's going to be about one year a minute but I think we can get through it. I start with this book because this is a book that my mom mailed to me when my son was born almost 25 years ago. And she wrote a note in the book. She said, this was your dad's favorite book. I don't remember the book, <laughs> but my mama don't lie. If she says this is my favorite book, this is my favorite book. What I remember is that I've been trying to answer this question, what is a frog, for as long as I can remember, for at least since I was four or five years old. And that Interest also started at my grandmother's house, which is here. My grandmother passed away in 2005. She was still living in, in that house in South Carolina. Her grandfather built that house. My grandmother was born in that house. My mother was born in that house. And when my grandmother passed, she still had the bill of sale for her grandmother in that house for when her grandfather bought her grandmother's freedom and the property and the house. So an incredible amount of history, an incredible amount of who I am was in that house. In addition, behind that house, as you just heard from the introduction, was a huge forest. And my weekends as a little kid were spent in that forest chasing snakes, chasing birds, chasing frogs. And, and I can share that with you now. This forest complements a Google Earth there's the house. It was just this tiny little thing, but I was a little kid. It seemed like the Amazon to me. I remember being lost in there for hours. Maybe it just meant I had a bad sense of direction, but I remember being lost in there for hours and hours and hours on end. And it, the time passed like nothing because 
I spent a lot of time with these guys. And I love birds, I love snakes, I love lizards. But and I, f I forget now, whoever I was talking to today, she'll know, I saw a Noah's Carolensis today. It's just, I saw him. <laughs> but I especially loved frogs. And I especially love frogs because of the magic that they presented. And, here, and here's the magic that I observed. They're completely exposed in the environment. Their development is external, the fertilization is external, and their development from the time the sperm meets the egg, without any fancy tools and microscopes, I could observe this. That's a single egg that's now starting to divide. In a few more hours, it'll look like this. In a few more hours, like this. In a few more hours, each one of those little dimples is now a cell that started from a single cell. And then in a few more hours, depending on the species, it undergoes gastrulation and neurulation, just like we did. In a few more hours, it turns into a living, swimming, breathing organism. And we did this. My mom was pregnant with my little brother, but we had no ultrasound. I knew something was going on, but I couldn't see it. For my Cub Scout programs when I was a little kid, I filmed bird eggs and birds developing in nests. I knew something was going on inside that eggshell, but I couldn't see it. But with frogs, I could see it all happening. I could see the magic. What's more is frogs do this extra thing that we don't do. They start out as a swimming, breathing, living organism, and then they completely transform into a brand new organism. They metamorphose. And that metamorphosis is all the things that are obvious that you can see. The tail goes away and it grows legs, the gills go away and it grows lungs, but all of that development, all of that magic has to be coordinated. Imagine, for example, if your tail went away before you had legs, you'd be just a little ball. Imagine if your gills went away before you had lungs, you wouldn't be able to breathe. So somehow all of these parts have to get coordinated and they have to be coordinated with the environment. Imagine if you took too long to metamorphose and the pond dried up. Imagine if you metamorphosed too early and you were tiny. And so I was interested in how you coordinate all those parts, all those changes, but also how all those parts and changes are coordinated with the environment. And it turns out that the way that these animals receive signals from the environment is through hormones, hormones that regulate genes. And it turns out the way that all these parts are coordinated is through hormones, hormones that regulate genes. And so literally in a frog, every gene that it takes to make a tadpole gets turned off and a whole new genome gets turned on to build this frog. And hormones coordinate that. But because these animals don't have a placenta, they don't have eggshells, they don't have membranes, anything in the environment, anything in the water that would interfere with those hormones will interfere with this wonderful coordination that's evolved over millions of years. And as an adult, that's what fascinated me. What also fascinated me about frogs is that they're incredibly altruistic. So for example, you see the frog on the top here has hurt its leg, and the one on the bottom is nice enough to give it a ride home. <laughs> I'm only joking. And, and it, you'd be surprised. Some people go, oh, wow, really? In fact, I can't tell you the punchline of the joke, but it goes something like, see what happens when you help a friend, because they lay these eggs on the way home. <laughs> and what I became interested in is that these eggs in the middle, each one of these clumps is about 2,000 eggs from a single female. But hundreds of females, in this species might lay their eggs all in one place. And what that means is, because the water's cold, the eggs in the middle, because of insulating effects, can be as much as 10 degrees warmer than the eggs on the edge. And what I became interested in is that this female's behavior, she gets there first and lays her eggs first. If her eggs are 10 degrees warmer, that means that they're gonna develop faster, that means they're gonna grow faster. And because temperature affects sex determination in some reptiles and in fish, and fish, it also might mean that she can manipulate the sex ratio of her offspring by laying her eggs there. So I got interested in sort of environmental regulation of sex determination, and I, I should have warned you, there's gonna be a lot of gonads on the screen tonight. I can almost guarantee you 100% that you will see more frog gonads tonight than you ever will in the rest of your life. I don't know, I don't, I don't wanna give you too high of expectations, but these are testes and these are ovaries, and I got interested in how temperature affected sex, whether or not you become male or female, whether or not you develop testis or ovaries in frogs. I also got interested in the interaction between genes and the environment. So if there wasn't an environmental influence, what boundaries do the genes, do potential sex chromosomes put on what the environment can do? Who's an undergrad? Who's younger than 50? 
Okay, see, I like to ask, because you see this slide here? This is, so here, my, my story, I started as a little boy who likes frogs. Where we're at in my story now is my senior year in college, because this is back before Adobe Photoshop, young people. This is back where cut and paste literally meant cut and paste. You had to cut it out, paste it on the page. This is a page from my senior honors thesis. There I am at age 19. There's Bruce Waldman, who you heard about. Took me under his wing and treated me like a graduate student. It was where I learned. If you're a little boy who likes frogs, I was pre-med because I didn't know what else you do. Here's where I learned what it is you do if you're a little boy who likes frogs and likes to do experiments. And if it wasn't, as you heard, if it wasn't for this guy and my wife who supported me, I never would have finished college. My second year in college, we used to call it Orgo. I took something called organic, right? Hard. In fact, it was so nice, I had to take it twice. <laughs> I didn't fail, though, because Harvard doesn't give Fs. They give A, B, C, D, E. I spent a whole semester trying to convince my parents that the E stood for excellent. <laughs> And then I just loved it so much, I was going to take it again. So young people, you might hit a bump in your career. Don't worry about it. You can get over it and still get on to what you want to do. At any rate, this was critical in my career. Maybe not so much for Laura. She doesn't look as excited as I was to be in a swamp at 6 AM on a Sunday morning. But it was like a dream come true for me and the start of my real professional career. The other thing I dreamed about as a kid was going to Africa. I remember my dad used to bring home these National Geographic magazines, and I would fold out the maps, and I would dream of going to this magical place. And it was a dream. My father made $9,000 a year for a family of five. First time I ever got on a plane was when I went to college. But when I got to graduate school, I got to go to Africa. And not only did I get to go to Africa, I got to go with this weird beard, but not only did I go to, go to Africa, National Geographic paid for it. I got to be on the magazine, I got to be on the show, I got to be in a commercial called Remarkable Men Drive Remarkable Toyotas, you Google it, sure. If you can imagine what it would be like to absolutely become what you dreamed about as a child, to become that guy that you watched on TV, that you read about in a magazine, that's what my life was like at this point. It was absolutely a dream come true. I got to work in a place called the Arabuku Sukoke in Kenya. And one of the cool things about working in Africa is you get to say words like Arabuku Sukoke. Who's ever said Arabuku Sukoke? There you go. While working in the Arabuku Sukoke, I discovered a frog, the kind of thing that just absolutely little boy who likes frogs is just amazed by. It was a frog called Hyperilis Argus, where the males and the females look completely different. I brought some of these back to the lab. And I discovered, see, now we had Adobe Photoshop. This is the same frog photograph once a day for six days. Looks a lot nicer. But I discovered, along with students, that they all start out green, and the females change color as sexual maturity. So I hypothesized, because see, now I'm a little boy who likes frogs, but I had just got my PhD, so you got to use the scientific method. I hypothesized that estrogen was important for this color change, because only the females change. So in the same way that when young girls reach puberty, estrogen makes their breasts grow, in the same way we hypothesize that estrogen makes this frog change color. And then we tested that in a real simple way. We just dipped the frogs in hormone. And if you dip them in testosterone, the so-called male hormone, nothing happens. But if you dip them in estrogen, they'll start changing color. Discovery. In fact, something weird happened after that. On February 15th, 1993, and I remember the date exactly because this is the day before my son was born. He cutened up. You saw him. <laughs> I thought it was the most beautiful thing ever. I was giving a talk at UC Davis on my color-changing frog, and my wife went into labor while I was giving the talk. And we were driving back down the highway after talking about my color-changing frog, and my wife, who had an MBA and an MPH, said, you should patent that frog. And I thought it was a Pregnancy hormones talking. I said, it's crazy. You can't patent a frog. Turns out you can patent a frog. So I patented this frog. I called it the Hyperilis argus. That's a species. Endocrine screen or the Hastes. <laughs> and that's when things got weird. Before I tell you how things got weird, let me tell you first why you patent the frog. You patent the frog like this because one, and you patent the process. Here's a control. That's an unexposed male. Here's one exposed to estradiol. That's the natural estrogen. That's an, if you're a sexually mature female, reproductive female, doesn't matter if you're a fish, a dog, a frog, a cat, a hog, or a human, if you're a sexually mature female, 
that steroid hormone circulates in your body, makes my frog change color. If you give it ethanyl estradiol, this is a synthetic estrogen used in birth control pill, makes my frog change color. If you give it DES, this is a synthetic pharmaceutical estrogen, my frog changes color. If you give it DDT, a pesticide that happens to bind to the estrogen receptor, they'll change color. Here's the bottom line. We screened a dozen compounds, me and two students, and we found that every estrogen that made my frog change color was also known to promote breast cancer. So we had a little frog, and we screened dozens of compounds, so we had a little frog that we could raise by the tens of thousands, and we could screen, we could screen water. You could send me some of your water, I'd dip my frog in it, if it changed color, I'd be like, oh, you might not want to drink that water. What's more is we showed that we could block the color change with a chemical called tamoxifen, a pharmaceutical that's an estrogen blocker used to treat breast cancer. So we could not only identify compounds that promote breast cancer, the number one cancer in women, but we could identify compounds that might be used to block breast cancer the same way they block my frog from changing color. Well, things got weird here because now a little boy who likes frogs got introduced to a grown-up word. I don't know why, I think grown-up words always come in two. I don't know, it's just my, my experience. In this case, the grown-up word was intellectual property. You see, the university, even though they weren't downstairs cleaning tanks and washing <laughs> test tubes, it was their intellectual property because they thought about it while I was their employee. So the university says, oh, it's a good idea, and if you don't show us how you're going to make money on it, we're going to sell it. So my wife, who had the MBA and the MPH at the time, and I, we set up a little mom and pop shop, thought we'd make a little lettuce on the side, you know, right? And we got our first customer, a little company called Novartis. I'm being obnoxious, the largest chemical company in the world said, we want you to test atrazine. I had never heard of that. Now you Google atrazine, you get Tyrone, you Google Tyrone, you get atrazine. We joined it to carbon bond. Here it is, it's an s chlorotriazine. For, for somebody who did so excellent in chemistry, it's amazing how much chemistry they have to use. It's an herbicide or a weed killer. It's mostly used on corn. It's been used since 1958, and we use 80 million pounds a year. It was at the time the number one selling chemical. It's used in more than 80 countries, but now it's outlawed in Europe. Outlawed in all of Europe. Now, here's my disclosure on this one. This isn't true. I know it's not true because the company lawyer now likes to email me, and, and they said it has not been outlawed in all of Europe. It has been denied regulatory approval by the European Union. <laughs> I don't know what the difference is. But I know that this pisses them off, so that's the slide I use. <laughs> that's just the kind of brother I am. <laughs> so here's what we did. We used another African frog, Xenopus lavus, from, from southern Africa. African clawed frog, Xenopus. How many people know Xenopus? How many people have heard? It's like the lab rat of the amphibian world. How many people know why, though? No? Well, close. It used to be the pregnancy test. In 1920, somebody figured out that the human pregnancy hormone will make this frog lay eggs. So in 1940, if you thought you were pregnant, you would go to the doctor, they would inject some urine into the frog, and if it laid eggs, you were either happy or sad, depending on your situation. <laughs> now, I tell my students, never show a slide unless you have three points to make. Otherwise, you're wasting people's time. Here's my three points. I tell you this for a couple reasons. One is it shows you the value of curiosity-based research. Right? Like, who's the first guy who thought, hey, you know, I wonder what will happen if I inject pee into a frog. Like, how, how do you come? Did they try snot first? I don't know. I, I don't, but it became incredibly important. The second reason I tell you this story is because it shows you the similarities between our hormones and my frogs. The estrogens that promote breast cancer are the same ones that make my frog change color. The human pregnancy hormone is so similar to this frog's hormones that it will make it lay eggs. That's why I call this a tale of toads and men, because as I tell you what atrazine does to hormones in this frog, you should be thinking, if you don't care about frogs, what might it do to me? And that's what we'll talk about today. Oh, I said three reasons. The third reason is, to save money, we collect these frogs from San Diego, because see, it turns out after they develop new pregnancy tests, people just threw these out. So I can go to San Diego and collect African clawed frogs and not have to pay for them which I guess technically makes mine African-American clawed frogs, but that's a point that's, that's not really relevant to this story. So the company asked us to figure out if atrazine interfered with hormones. We showed that atrazine inhibited growth of the voice box of the larynx. Now, that's bad news 
because the larynx, the voice box depends on testosterone. And the same reason that men in general have deeper voices than women, testosterone is the same reason that male frogs sing and females don't. So this is, this is not good news. If you think there's a problem with testosterone, you go to the, I told you, gonna be a lot of gonads. You go to the gonads, and some of the animals we found out look like this. So here's kidneys, but here's an animal with two testes. Here's an animal that's got more ovaries, it's got testes, it's got, this frog could hurt its leg and give itself a ride home. <laughs> it's just like, and that's not normal. And by that I mean, I don't mean a judgment, I just mean that unlike you may have learned in Jurassic Park, amphibians are not naturally hermaphroditic. Trust me, I've seen more frog gonads than all of you combined will ever see in your life. This is not what occurs without exposure to a chemical like atrazine. So we developed, what do, you, what do you think we did next? I just told you, scientific method. We developed a hypothesis. And in this case, our hypothesis was the following. If you have a testis, so imagine that this is your test. In fact, imagine somebody you don't like, because we're going we're gonna to do something kind of not so nice. If you have a testis, you should make testosterone. You know what the word testosterone means? You know what a portmanteau is? Portmanteau. I didn't learn that word until I was 49 years old. That's when you stick two words together. Like smoke and fog, you get smog. Twist and jerk, you get twerk. Testosterone <laughs> is a portmanteau that literally means testicular hormone. So it's, quote, the male hormone. And so hypothesis was that atrazine turned on an enzyme, aromatase, the machinery, if you will, that converts testosterone into estrogen. Another portmanteau, it means the generator of estrus. And that happens at the expense of testosterone, so you're demasculinized, your larynx doesn't grow, and you're feminized because now you're making the female hormone, which is fine if you're a female, maybe not so much if you're a male. So we tested this, we measured testosterone levels in control males, here's atrazine treated males, here's control females, and now here's where we're at in my story. By this time, I was coming up for tenure, I was an assistant professor, and we published this paper are maphroditic, demasculized frogs after exposure to the herbicide atrazine at low ecologically relevant doses. And not only did we publish it, we published it in PNAS, Proceedings to the National Academy of Sciences. You guys know PNAS? I called my mom. I said, Ma, got a paper coming out in PNAS. I said, Ma, she said, I heard you. I just don't know how you get a paper cut on your penis. I said, no, no, my mom, she's gonna kill me. It's a 100% true story. My mom called me back, my mom called me back the next week and she said, how important was that paper? I said, really, mom? She goes, I went to Barnes and Noble, they never heard of that magazine. <laughs> now, and I'll come back to why I tell that story, this is now my most important paper. It's a book that I didn't write that's written for kids, but my mom can get it in Barnes and Noble. I'll tell you why that's important at the end. By the way, four black men and a Latina co-authored that paper. It's probably a record for the National Academy, something that I'm very proud of. As important as it was, though, in all those respects, a lot more needed to be done. See, we didn't know if the hermaphrodites were males with ovaries or females with testes, because as I discovered in, in undergraduate, frogs don't have sex chromosomes. And we had a good idea, because if we would treat with atrazine, we might get 50% females, 30% males, 20% hermaphrodites. So we had a good idea, and it fit with our hypothesis. We also didn't know what happens when these animals become adults, because we only looked at the little metamorphs. And that sounds like an easy question to answer, except that it takes about five years for these animals to grow up. So you've got to get an undergraduate or a graduate student and say, hey, 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 I have a project idea for you. And maybe by the time you graduate, <laughs> we might have. It actually took longer than that. It actually took about eight years. And here's the answer. Crazy. I remember I sent, oh, let me, let, me, let me tell you what you're looking at first. They always, you know, they hurt their legs all the time. Poor things. But by the time the paper came out, a gene had been discovered that was only in females called DMW. So sometimes we do fancy PCR and stuff like that. But that allowed us to show that this guy who looks like he's smiling is a male genetically. And that's his brother genetically. About 10% completely grew up to be females and lay eggs we only knew the difference because we had the molecular tools. Now, I probably could have published that. Males turning into females, but I had tenure. I was in no hurry. 
So next I wanted to know, what about the other 90%? What about the males that didn't grow ovaries? Can they reproduce at all? The problem is these frogs breed in the spring, and as you may know, so do undergraduates. So I work with a lot of undergraduates. I got to get them to stay around for spring break. They want to go to some pool party thing. And, and so I devised a plan. I said, what if, and this was 2008, what if I have the pool party? You can stay here, have your spring break, and get a PNAS paper. How many, how many of you guys would do that? Hayes Lab pool party, and you get a major publication, right? OK, went something like this. <laughs> This is 100% true. I don't make this stuff up. This was our apparatus. This is our apparatus. So we took, we took, we put four females in there, four control males, four atrazine-treated males. And I know, fellas, this ain't the sex ratio you want when you go to the club. But the idea is we wanted the females to be limited to see if the males could compete. And so we did these experiments, and I'm going to walk you through it. We put them in there at 7 p.m., put on a little Marvin Gaye. You young people don't know nothing about that. The lights go out. And you come back in the morning, and you just look, and there's stitches in there so we can tell who's who. And you just ask who got the hookup and who didn't. Real simple. We did it four times. Actually, we did it five times. But one morning, one of the students kicked the pool, and we, they broke up. We couldn't see who was together. Yeah, she got asked to find another job. And then <laughs> I'm only joking. She's actually a doctor now. And here's the deal. The atrazine-treated males almost never got the female. Almost never, only in two cases. Well, I'm an endocrinologist, not a behavioral biologist. I got to measure some hormones. I got to do something. So imagine you're at the club, the lights come on, somebody's going around writing down names of who's with who. Then you pull you apart, stick a needle in your heart, and take a blood sample. That's how this went down. And when you do that, you find out, as you might guess, because I already told you, that on average, the control males have higher testosterone than the atrazine-treated males. But what's more significant is if you look at who made the love connection, the ones who get the female, it's almost like there's a cutoff. It's almost like these guys don't have enough testosterone. Either the females don't like them or the other males beat them up, but they can't compete. At the time, we didn't know if the males got the female because they had testosterone or did they have high testosterone because they got the female. Turns out now we know that whether or not you get the female depends on your testosterone levels the night before you're in the pool. And these guys just don't make enough testosterone to be competitive. Atrazine has depressed their testosterone levels. I could have published that, but I had tenure. I was in no hurry. So next I did what I call the Motel 6 experiments. <laughs> in this case, I just got him a room and said, no competition. Can you fertilize eggs if you're exposed to atrazine? And when you do that, you collect the eggs. You, know, you leave them alone for a night. You collect the eggs. You let them develop. And then you simply determine how many are unfertilized, shown here, versus how many are fertilized as a measure of the male's fertility. This is a very, very complicated scientific procedure. I'm just being obnoxious. There's a student in lab going, one, two, <laughs> three. He actually went to law school So <laughs> after. And, and it turns out, here's the answer. 85% of the eggs are fertilized by an unexposed male. Atrazine-treated male only fertilizes about 15% for two reasons. One is they don't even try. They just sit there and watch the frogs, the females, lay eggs. The other one is, if you look at their testis under the microscope, who, 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 who likes statistics? Who likes p-values? They're awesome, right? You know what I like even better, though? When you can see the difference. And I could print out pictures, and I did, of the testers and show them the students, and they could put them in the two piles, not even knowing what they were. Because if you're exposed to uh, atrazine, the following happens. Here's a testicular tubule. I blew that up. You see all those dark marks in there? That's sperm. Soldiers, ready to go. If you look at these atrazine-treated animals, here's their testicular tubule. You, you can see the outline. Cellular debris. They don't have enough testosterone to show the behavior. And even if they did, they don't have enough testosterone to maintain sperm production. Most of their testicular tubules are empty. So I published that, along with a whole bunch of other stuff that I won't bother you with and show you, but, but that was enough. I published it in a paper that I called another PNAS paper, but my mom knew what it was this time. Atrazine induces complete feminization and chemical castration. And male African cloth, chemical castration. Chemical castration. You know it's a grown-up word, because it comes in too. Chemical castration. The company hates the term chemical castration. That's why I put it in the title. 
That's just the kind of brother I am. The other thing that's important, nine undergraduates co-authored this paper. Every one of them now has either a PhD or an MD. I'm proud of that. They did that, but I helped them get there, I hope. The next thing we wanted to know is we wanted to know if there were effects in other species or is the African clawed frog just weird? So we looked at the North American leopard frog and we discovered that they didn't become hermaphrodites. But if you look, so, so here's, the, I told you a lot of gonads. Here's the testis. And then you see all this, I call it junk in the trunk. You see all this stuff here at the back? Those are all eggs that are yoking up and bursting through the surface of this male's testis. Now I thought that wasn't good. So at this point I was interacting with the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. And so at this point I emailed, and I broke, I almost want to say curfew, I broke embargo. Because this paper was slated to be published in Nature, another one of those magazines that my mom can't get. And by the way, I was coming up for full professor now, too. So this paper was about to be published, but I sent the data to the EPA, and I'll never forget, they wrote me back and they said, Dear Dr. Hayes, this is an interesting finding. However, we do not view it as an adverse effect that would stimulate reassessment and regulation of atrazine. It's not an adverse effect. Now, my wife, who's going to kill me if she knows that I showed this photo, my wife tells me there is nothing more painful in life than childbirth, and I have to say, based on the G.I. Joe Kung Fu grip she had on my hand when my son was born, I gotta give her that. But I would guess that a dozen chicken eggs in my testicle would have to be in the top five most painful <laughs> experience. And I'm sure the men agreed, they're like nodding, yeah. EPA says it's not an adverse effect, so keep using it. We published a paper in Nature, and one of the reasons that we worked in the North American leopard frog is we, want to know, we wanted to know if these effects occur in the wild. And we wanted to use an American frog where we could do this. Now let me give you an idea of the levels we're talking about. We're using 0.1 parts per billion. That's 0.1 micrograms per liter. That's 0.1 nanograms per mil. That's 100 picograms per mil. That's like 1 1,000th one of a grain of salt in two liters. That's what we're using to produce these effects. The package of atrazine recommends application at 2.9 to 29 million parts per billion. I'll do the math for you. A typical farmer may be using this stuff at levels that are 290 million times higher than we're using in my laboratory. This is a log scale, and I'm going to show you from the published literature now the minimum and maximum detectable in agricultural runoff, temporary pools, permanent water, precipitation. Here's the level we're using in the lab. Here's every environment that would be at risk. There's enough atrazine in rainwater to chemically castrate and feminize frogs. A half million pounds of atrazine come down into rainwater every year. It goes up on dust, it travels in clouds, and it can come down 1,000 kilometers from where it's applied. That's 600 miles for Americans. Here's what the levels allowed in your drinking water, according to the EPA. 30 times higher than we know to be biologically effective. In fact, environmental health, I just met, I just met someone from environmental health and safety here. We have an environmental health and safety. And they wrote me an email. They said, Dr. Hayes, we're concerned about your experiments. What are you going to do with the wastewater when you're done? And I emailed back and I said, I'm going to take it up and drink it. Because it's, see, I thought that was funny too. Because so, <laughs> it's guaranteed to have less than what's allowed in drinking water. So it's out there. This is now more gonads. Here's a testis from a frog, here's the kidneys. And I'm gonna show you, it looks normal, but I'm gonna show you what the inside looks like. I'm gonna show you what's called a transverse serial cross-section. So just imagine I'm slicing a salami. I'm gonna fold out a slice. The color's gonna be different because of the stain we use to color it under the microscope. And I'm gonna blow up that slice, and I'm gonna blow up this section. Because what we discovered is here are testicular tubules, except instead of sperm in there, they've got eggs. We publish this in Nature. We call them testicular oocytes. Grown-up word. Testicular oocytes. A company lawyer wrote a letter to Nature magazine when it was published. They wanted the paper retracted. You know why? Because I made up a word. I responded, aren't all words made up before they're a word? <laughs> Plus, I went to Harvard. I could make up a word and give a brother a break. Here's what we did. We, 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 we sampled across the country water and frogs. We controlled for latitude. I'm just being obnoxious. This is Highway I-80, and, and we were driving to a conference in Indiana, <laughs> and we collected frogs and water along the way and got a nature vapor. That's, that's fuel efficiency right there, right? So it turns out 
And the red shows where most of the atrazine is used. But it turns out everywhere we found atrazine, we found feminized frogs and vice versa. But the reason it got published in Nature is because we also had the laboratory data to show that if we collected frogs here and raised them in clean water, they didn't come out as feminized. And if we collected frogs here and raised them in atrazine, they came out feminized. So there was not just a correlation. We could show that there was cause and effect. Here's where we get to the part where we leave the frogs. If you don't care about the frogs, here's, here's, here's where we leave that. This is Lake Nabugabo in Uganda, where I used to work. And I show this because there's a crop there. I believe it's arrowroot. And the runoff from that crop goes into these containers and serves as the cooking and bathing and drinking water for this nearby village. And I show this because it shows this, not the similarity, but the oneness of environmental health and public health. And given the similarities of our hormones and frog hormones and the similarities for, of how they're made and how they work, I would bet if I told one of these guys in the village, you know, the fish and the frogs in that water have these issues, because they're drinking directly out of that, they would see that connection. Where somehow we're so removed that here's my village, I live somewhere here, my water comes from there, and we have this assumption that our environmental protection agency wouldn't allow anything bad in our water, it wouldn't impact us. Not only am I gonna tell you that we have to worry, but what about the agriculture workers and the factory workers that are directly exposed? One of the sites that we set out to find out how pesticides were impacting animals is Salinas. We're collected exactly right there, surrounded by agriculture, as you can see. And how many, how many people have heard of Salinas? How many people know? How many people have eaten anything from Salinas? Everybody raise your hand. 85% of the country's lettuce comes out of Salinas. 85%. If you've eaten strawberries or blackberries from Drixel, you've eaten from Salinas. And I can tell you that the frogs living in the water that ran off of that food you ate aren't doing too well. I don't have time to talk about that today. But what I do want to point out is that I benefited from that liberal arts education where I hated having to do stuff that wasn't science. But one of the benefits I found in Steinbeck's East of Eden, because Steinbeck in East of Eden wrote about Salinas. He wrote, Salinas was surrounded and penetrated with swamps with tooled filled ponds, and every pond spawned thousands of frogs. With the evening, the air was so full of their song that it was a kind of roaring silence. It was a veil, a background, and a sudden disappearance as after a clap of thunder was a shocking thing. It is possible if in the night the frog song should have stopped, everyone in Salinas would have awakened feeling that there was a great noise in their millions. The frog song seemed to have a beat and a cadence, and perhaps it is the ear's function to do this just as it is the eye's business to make stars twinkle. I love this. Here's what Selena sounds like now. I didn't, I didn't need to plug in the speaker because there's nothing to hear. Silent. I haven't heard a single native frog call in the six, now seven years that I've been working there. And what I love about that piece is it wasn't a piece of scientific literature, but a literary artist wrote about it. The frog song was so important that a literary artist in a book that had nothing to do with science or frogs wrote about it, and now it's gone. Our silent night is there. I think that's much more important than even a piece of scientific literature. And I'm not going to tell you that they're gone just because of atrazine or just because of pesticides. The main reason they're gone is habitat loss. And this is a, from a paper I published with my graduate students. But if you're living in an environment where the only water that's available is agricultural runoff, that has pesticides in it, that lowers your immune function, that impairs your reproduction, you throw in invasive species and climate change, and these chemicals are playing a critical role in the synergistic effect of all the things that we're doing to the earth. I call this from Silent Spring to Silent Night because in much the same way that Rachel Carson taught, that the death of birds and the role of pesticides in our silent spring was a warning to us, I believe that our new canary in the coal mine, the disappearing amphibian, is also a warning to us. Our silent night is telling us something. More than 70% of all amphibians globally are in decline. A class of animals that survived the extinction of the dinosaurs, and we are directly responsible for the reasons that they're disappearing. If you don't care about that, though, 
A colleague of mine wrote, in echoepidemiology, the occurrence of an association in more than one species and species population is very strong evidence for causation. I've told you about more than just correlation. I've told you about controlled experiments in more than one population, more than one species, more than one genera, more than one family of frog. But it turns out there's evidence across every class that's been examined from fish to birds to reptiles and mammals, not just my frogs. I emailed everybody in the world that worked on atrazine. I said, hey, let's write a paper together. 22 agreed from 12 different countries. I coined the term gonadotoxin in this paper. It doesn't come in two, but it was enough to upset the company. They wrote another letter. You know, somewhere, I think in Science Magazine, maybe, another one of those magazines my mom can't get in Barnes & Noble, I read that all of language, like all of Homo sapiens, came out of Africa. Just doing what people are good at, you know? So it turns out that when I get together with all these people, we show that it's not just frogs. Here's sperm in the testis. Give it atrazine, no sperm. This guy in Belgium has shown that his sperm in the testis is a fish. Give it atrazine, no sperm. This is a couple in Argentina with a caiman, a big uh, crocodile -like animal. Sperm in the testis. Give it atrazine, no sperm. This work was done in Croatia and in Nigeria. Sperm in the testis of a rat. Give it atrazine, no sperm. This work was done in Pakistan. Sperm in the testis of a bird, quail give it atrazine, no sperm. So it wasn't just me, it wasn't just, the company was saying, oh, it's just some crazy guy at Berkeley, there's nothing wrong with atrazine. Well, I might be a crazy guy from Berkeley, but this was being discovered, found all over the world. What's more is the idea that the sperm was gone because the testosterone was gone, it's being discovered all over the world. Here's salmon, this is a guy in England. Here's my work in frogs, here's work in rats that the company themselves produced. So it wasn't just me, it wasn't just frogs. This suggests there's a real problem. And if you look at humans, you don't really do experiments, but my colleague Shauna Swan showed the following. Here's atrazine levels in men in Columbia, Missouri, and the red shows that if you have atrazine in your urine at 0.1 parts per billion, you have a low sperm count and you can't get your wife pregnant. It's just a correlation, but imagine if you have a chemical in your body that's been shown experimentally to reduce sperm in fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and laboratory rodents, if you have that chemical in your body, you have a low sperm count. What's more is, and watch, I squashed the data down, it's still there, because here's levels from another study of men in California who work in fields, and I'm going to squash it down again, because here's the levels of atrazine in men who apply it. 2,400 parts per billion, 2,400 parts per billion. 2,400 parts, per, that's 24,000 times higher than what we know is associated with low fertility in men in Columbia, Missouri. That's 24,000 times higher than what we're using to chemically castrate frogs and fish in the laboratory. One of these guys could pee in a bucket and I could dilute the atrazine in their urine 24,000 times and use the atrazine in their urine to chemically castrate and feminize 24,000 buckets of 30 tadpoles each. We know nothing about their reproductive health because they're primarily Latinx with life expectancies in the agricultural com working community of 50 years. And not only are they exposed to atrazine, they're exposed to chemicals like chlorpicrin, which was originally developed as a nerve gas in World War II. They're exposed to chemicals like 2,4-D, which was a component of Agent Orange used to destroy food in Southeast Asia during wartime. We're now spraying it on our food and on these individuals. A little boy who likes frogs now gets introduced to another grown-up word, environmental justice, environmental racism. Does atrazine turn on aromatase? And I'll have more to say about that. It'll cause vitiligenesis and oogenesis in frogs. That means growing eggs in your testis. Here's my frogs. Somebody else has shown that this occurs in fish. This is at the US Geological Survey. Somebody else has shown that this occurs in turtles. That's not going to happen in humans because we have mechanisms to protect against that. In humans, you'd be worried about mammary cancer and prostate cancer because they depend on estrogen in part, especially mammary cancer. With regards to prostate cancer, they showed in their own factory that there's an 8.4-fold increase in prostate cancer in men who work in their factory bagging atrazine in a community that's 80% black, that's 80% African-American. And I'll show you why I bring that up in a second. The company, I said this once, and a lawyer wrote me a letter and he said, 
that he wanted me to stop saying that. He said, we don't put our factory in that community because black people live there. We put our factory in that community because it's a low-income community and that's where black people tend to live. And I was like, how is that better than what I said? I, 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 maybe he just likes to write letters, I don't know. So there's another paper that showed with a very strong p-value that if your drinking water is contaminated with atrazine, you're more likely to get breast cancer compared to women who live in the same community but don't drink the contaminated water. And that's just a correlation, but if you look at rats, as I told you, there's a decrease in testosterone and there's a concomitant increase in estrogen. But what's more is, and I'm putting the references up there so you know it's not my work, but what's more is they showed that if you give rats atrazine, there's a significant increase in mammary tumors in those rats. So it's a correlation in humans, but if you give rats atrazine, they develop tumors just like in the correlation and consistent, as I'll show you, with the mechanism that we've defined. Here's a cell line. If you take a human cell line, and this is another paper, but we've also published the same thing I talked about earlier today. If you take a cell line that doesn't normally express aromatase and make estrogen and give it atrazine, that cells, those human cells, will start making estrogen. Just like we've seen in fish, just like we've seen in amphibians, just like we've seen in reptiles, just like we've seen in birds, just like we've seen in rodents. This is now a human cell line. Why would we be any different than these other animals? I went to visit them. I still think they should replace the Y with the I, but you know, nobody listens to me. San Gabriel, Louisiana, they have a pipe that flows straight into the Mississippi River and into the Gulf of Mexico. 1.2 million pounds of atrazine flow into the Gulf of Mexico every year. Nobody's studying it. Much of the community looks like this. What I'm showing you now are the top 13 cancers that you're going to get living in the U.S. What I'm showing you now in red, 11 of the 13 are the ones that you're more likely to get if you're black, if you're African American. What I'm showing you now are the mortality rates to cancer relative to white or Caucasian Americans corrected for socioeconomic status and access to health care. If you're black, it's a risk factor. If you're black in America, you're more likely to get 11 out of 13 and more likely to die from 13 out of 13 cancers. I can show you similar data for Latinx individuals. Here's my thing. I gave a talk once for Coleman for the Cure. They didn't give me no money, but they wanted me to give a talk. I called my talk an ounce of prevention. I don't think they liked the title. My colleagues who study cancer tell me less than 30% of cancer is about genetics. So that when your doctor tells you you're more likely to get breast cancer if, if your brother, your sister, somebody in your family has, they're not telling you you have bad genes. They're telling you you've been exposed to the same crap as the rest of your family. And if you're a minority, if you're low income, if you're first generation, if you're an immigrant, you're more likely to live and work in areas that we know are associated, or that work in areas where you're exposed to chemicals that we know are associated with adverse health outcomes. And I'm all about finding the cure, but with the exception of HeLa, none of the cell lines that we use in cancer research to find this cure come from minority men or women. So even if you find the cure, it may be irrelevant to the individuals who are more likely to get and more likely to die from the same cancers that you're studying. The problem is you can't put a name on, you can't make money from prevention. You can make money on the following though. This is from my graduate student who showed that if you take a human breast cancer cell and expose it to atrazine, it starts making aromatase. Shouldn't be a surprise. Breast cancer depends on estrogen. Which in a way is confusing, right? Because most people get breast cancer after menopause, when your estrogen levels in your blood are lower than they've ever been in your life. So why? One, breast cancer depends on lifetime exposure to estrogen. And two, when you get breast cancer, the cells around it express aromatase. They make their own estrogen, so the cancer makes its own hormones to stimulate its growth and reproduction. In fact, aromatase expression is so important that the number one treatment for breast cancer right now is a chemical called letrozole that knocks out aromatase and decreases estrogen so that your damaged cancer cells don't divide and spread throughout your body. How much sense does that make when the number one treatment for breast cancer has to compete with a chemical that does exactly the opposite, that turns on aromatase, that increases estrogen, and is known to promote breast cancer in rats? Turns out Novartis Oncology offers treatments for cancers that range from breast cancer. This is on their website. So in the year 2000, 
the same company that gave us 80 million pounds of atrazine, which turns on aromatase, was selling letrozole to block aromatase. The same company, so that if you were taking letrozole to fight your breast cancer, that was competing with a chemical made by the same company that does the opposite. I published a paper called The One Stop Shop, Chemical Causes and Cures for Breast Cancer. <laughs> you can imagine I got a few letters from their lawyer, but I just stated a fact. So I think what's happened is that my interest in this aquatic organism has taught me a great deal about this aquatic organism. We start out in water, just like my tadpoles. We start out as fetuses that depend on estrogen, testosterone, thyroid hormone, cortisol, the exact same hormones that my tadpole depend, tadpoles depend on. And we now know that you, that your children, will be exposed to over 300 synthetic chemicals before they leave the womb. Most of them, we have no idea what they do. The best thing about atrazine is that we know. We know from rat studies that it causes prostate and mammary cancer. It's not my work, it's peer reviewed and published, it's not mine. We know from rat studies that it causes immune failure. We know that if you're exposed as a pregnant rat, it causes neural damage. We know that if you're exposed as a rat when you're pregnant, you're more likely to have an abortion. And the work I'm about to show you now affected me more than anything I did on my own. That was done by an EPA laboratory. Another EPA laboratory showed that if those rats that don't abort, the sons are born with prostate disease. Another EPA laboratory published data showing that if those rats that don't abort, the daughters are born with impaired mammary development, and when they grow up, they are incapable of properly feeding their offspring, so they experience retarded growth and development. And this moved me more than anything that I'd done. Because you see, that rat on the bottom, that rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. The rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. The rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. So when I think about my little girl, she's 22 now, when I think about the fact that my grandchildren could be affected by chemicals that we're using today, your grandchildren could be affected by chemicals that we're using today made me realize that I have a much bigger responsibility than just a little boy who likes frogs. A colleague of mine showed that if you get pregnant during peak atrazine contamination, you're more likely to have a baby with malformations, with birth defects. It's just a correlation. And I'm going to apologize to the young people in the audience. I, if you can, I'll cue you when to close your eyes, because I have some images that I don't want you to see. Here's a paper. It's not mine. Here's a paper that shows that maternal exposure to surface water atrazine is associated with fetal gastrothesis. And yeah, please cover your eyes. I didn't know what fetal gastrothesis is. One of my students is now an MD studies this. It's when the baby's born with the intestines on the outside of the body. Here's another paper that shows that maternal residential atrazine exposure is associated with the risk of coenal atresia. I didn't know what that was. It's when the baby's no nasal and oral cavities don't close up. And what's more interesting to me is here's a case control study of maternal residential atrazine exposure and male genital malformations. If you're exposed to atrazine and you have a son, you're more likely to have a baby with hypospadias. That's where the urethra doesn't end all the way through the penis. You're more likely to have a baby with crotorchidism. That's where the testicles don't descend into the scrotum. You're more likely to have a son whose phallus doesn't grow. And I, and I say it interests me more. The images are gone now. I say it interests me more because you know what controls male genital malformation in the fetus? Testosterone. And if you're exposed to a chemical that lowers testosterone in every experimental animal that's been studied, you have a baby that looks like it didn't have enough testosterone. We know that estrogens like DES can cause these malformations if the mother takes it when she's pregnant. And if you're exposed to a chemical that increases estrogen in every animal model that's been studied, you have a baby that looks like it was exposed to too much estrogen. Right now, somebody brought this up earlier, and I showed this guy because he doesn't like me. He works for the company. 
But most of our toxicity is defined by effects on the adult white male, not on women and not on babies. We know that something that might not affect an adult white male, we know that these chemicals can cross the placenta and have profound effects on the developing fetus, permanent effects. We know that even after the baby's born, many of these chemicals can come across in the milk and have profound effects. We know that a little bit of toxin to an adult is a lot of toxin to a growing young person. The EPA said, an article came out in New Yorker magazine, a monetary value, this was just two years ago, and it was regarding my work. They said a monetary value is assigned to disease, impairments, and shortened lives and weighed against the benefits of keeping a chemical in use. So the EPA is not saying that atrazine or other chemicals that they regulate are safe. They're saying we know they do bad stuff. But a monetary value, an agency in the Obama administration said a monetary value is assigned to disease, impairments, and shortened lives. The problem is we know that the price that's on this individual developing fetus is not the same as on this one. We know that the people paying the price are different. We know that the monetary value on this young baby is different than the ones on this one. We know that the monetary value on this young baby is different than the ones that are on my own in a country, if not a world, where we ascribe that we all are equal. Maybe we're created that way, but maybe for sure that's not the way it ends up. When I started thinking about this environmental justice thing, I started thinking about my state. You know about California? We're the fifth largest economy in the world. If we were our own country, we'd be the fifth richest country in the world. You know why? Not because of Hollywood, not because of tech, because of agriculture. One in 10 jobs, 30% of the land, 350 ag products, and here's something that I didn't know. I don't know if you know this. 50%, half of the US's food comes from California. Half of everything you eat in the United States comes from California. As a result, we use more pesticides than any other state, and 90% of the workers are Hispanic or Latinx. If I put in red now the top 10 counties for agriculture in California, these are the counties. This is the 30% that makes us the fifth largest economy in the world. Where do you think the 30 poorest towns are in California? So that means that the people who make us the fifth richest country in the world are the unintended targets of chemicals that we know are designed to kill things. And the EPA says they have to pay that price because somebody else gets the benefits. Those benefits don't include feeding the world. We, look at this, this is a graph of where all the corn goes from the National Corn Growers Association. Can you see what's missing from that graph? Food, it doesn't even show up. We eat less than 2% of the corn that we grow in a world where 20% dies of starvation. And we're using a chemical that increases that 2% by 1.2%. But that's $100 million because of atrazine. Part of the problem is we live in a world where the blue dots are our food. 90% of our seeds are owned by the red dots, six chemical companies. And when I was your age, when I was young, the promise of GMO was drought-resistant wheat and frost-resistant strawberries and more nutritious rice. 90% of GMO now goes to make crops chemical-resistant so that we can use more pesticides because the companies that own the seed are in the business of selling chemicals. They're in the business, like any drug dealer, of making their customers dependent. That's my issue with GMO. My issue is that people inside the EPA and the FDA, that even Obama appointed a Monsanto vice president to head the FDA. Whew. So that all changed my life. My professor used to say, don't be an advocate. Let the science speak for itself. I very quickly realized, and, and I'm told I have to walk across this slide when I show it, I crossed the line. Some of you may have heard there were some emails. And yeah, where I, where I come from, we use the F word a little bit. And I was on my own. And there was a time when I go to speak at a university and headlines like this would show up in the university newspaper. Controversy surrounds UO, it was University of Oregon. It turns out, 
I don't know if I use the word vindicated, but the company lost a $105 million lawsuit. I didn't get any of the money. I, I helped the lawyers. But what was important about that lawsuit is that all of their secret documents, things that I knew they were doing to me and talking about, became public. That was the topic of a New Yorker magazine a couple years back. And they said to New Yorker magazine at this time, their spokesperson from Syngenta said, I am troubled by a suggestion that we have ever tried to discredit anyone. Our focus has always been on communicating the science and setting the record straight. I am troubled. They have never tried to discredit anyone. And they're saying that because I said they went after me. They tried to discredit me. Where on earth would I get an idea like that? Well, it turns out in their documents, see, it says filed under seal, privileged and confidential. This was from one of their meetings about me. And look at their number one goal on science. Look what their number one goal was. Made me proud that they couldn't find enough problems in my data to get it retracted, so they went after me. They made lists. <laughs> Thank you. They made lists in these meetings. I mean, they got one thing right. See right here, they said, don't disrespect them. They knew I wasn't playing around. <laughs> look, but they said I'm paranoid and schizophrenic. But look, they made lists of, I don't want to use the S word, but they made lists of stuff that they were going to do to me, and they ranked it for how risky it was. But look, they wrote things down like investigate students and investigate wife, family background. They had plans to buy my name on the internet. And my favorite here is they wrote, set a trap. Somebody sat in a meeting, and as part of their strategy to get Tyrone, somebody actually wrote down, set a trap, in case you might forget. Oh, by the way, we were supposed to set a trap. They, 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 more risky, they developed a psychological profile. I think their whole goal was to do stuff that was so crazy that if I talked about it, I would look crazy. But the problem is they wrote it down. They paid somebody, you can see. They paid somebody $10,000, I'm told, to find out if I'm crazy. They paid somebody $10,000. Three things I'll tell you about that. One, you ain't got to pay nobody $10,000 to find out if Tyrone crazy. You can just ask anybody who knows me. They'd be like, oh yeah. Two, what's the positive outcome? They're going to come back and say, oh, yeah, he's crazy. He also won. Or they're going to come back and say, no, he ain't crazy. You just pissed off a black guy. Because, see, some of y'all get confused. You don't know that many of us. We're emotional people. <laughs> here's, here's the, the, I got four things to say about this one, because here's the third. I, I guess it's one. And this is unprofessional. So, so young people, don't repeat these words. I'd much rather be crazy and stupid. And if you sat in a room and wrote this down and didn't think I was going to clown you when it came out, if you considered yourself a hunter, the first page of the evil spy handbook says you don't write it down. And if you do, you burn it and eat it and self-destruct it. You don't turn it into a judge and write privileged and confidential on top of it. I'd rather be crazy than stupid. And if you sat in a room and wrote down set a trap, you're not just stupid, you're a special kind of stupid. <laughs> this is not so funny, and then I'm going to end tonight so we can move on. The EPA said to New Yorker, it is unfortunate, but not uncommon for registrants to sit on data that may be considered adverse to the public's perception of their products. Science can be manipulated to serve certain agendas. All you can do is practice suspended disbelief. The EPA is saying that they know the companies hide data and lie, and there's nothing they can do about it. They wrote that down. Here's one of the things that the company wrote down in their secret documents. They wrote, TBA may be a bit more potent than atrazine. So one, they're admitting that atrazine's bad. TBA may be a bit more potent than atrazine. Lower doses cause the same effects. They wrote active part of compound as chlorine, degradation same as atrazine. They went on the right that it increases mammary tumors and testicular tumors. I'm not telling you that. These are the company's notes in one of their Tyrone meetings. They wrote that down. You know what TBA is, this chemical they're talking about? Here's atrazine, and you know I'm no chemist, but I can look this up. TBA is terbutalazine. There it is. It differs by one methyl group. You know what TBA is? They wrote that note in 2002. When the atrazine was banned in Europe in 2002, they replaced it in terbut with terbutalazine. So somebody sat in a room, somebody with parents and neighbors and kids, 
not only sat in a room and said, huh, atrazine turns on aromatase, causes breast cancer. Let's sell a pharmaceutical that does the opposite. Somebody sat in a room and wrote that down and then said, yeah, it's worse than atrazine. Let's send it to Europe. So I can't follow this philosophy because the other side is not letting science speak for itself. The other side says things like this on their website, that they assume no obligation to update forward-looking statements to <laughs> reflect actual results. Who says, can I say crap? Who says crap like that? I'm assuming the lawyer wrote it. But more importantly, the EPA said in 2006 about my work, they said the ultimate decision is much bigger than science. They wrote, it weighs in public opinion. And you know what I immediately thought about when I read this? My mom. The EPA is counting on my mom to be informed and to tell it what to do. And I'm publishing all my work in a place that she has no access to. We're rewarding each other as professors, as academics in the ivory tower for things that mean nothing to most of the world. And in many cases, we're punishing people who reach out to the public and try to have that outreach. Certainly, we don't reward them in this ivory tower. So I follow a different philosophy now, too. I want to share two philosophies from two great thinkers that have changed the way I think as a little boy who likes frogs. Not only can you be an advocate, but somebody once said, quote, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. So not only can you be both, some people think, like this guy, that you have a duty. And again, I'm not privileged in that sense, but I've been to Harvard, I've been to Berkeley, I've got information, I have that duty. The other great thinker said, it's time for us as a people to start making some changes. Let's change the way we eat, let's change the way we live, let's change the way we treat each other. You see, the old way wasn't working, so it's on us to do what we gotta do to survive. This guy said that. Thank you. Thank you again for the invitation. And thank you for sharing time with me today and tonight. If there are questions or, 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 or comments, I'm more than happy to address them. Thank you very much. There is no other way. If anyone has questions, please step up. I would like to know why uh, Syngenta asked you to research atrazine. So they already knew. I have, I have evidence. They already knew what atrazine did. The idea, the way these things work is the EPA requires some research to be done. By capturing, I, would, I at the time was a brand new young assistant professor. By throwing a lot of money at me at catching me, it allows them to have control over the research and when it's published. Otherwise, I'd be liable. It allows them to say to the EPA, we're spending millions of dollars on this problem. It allows the EPA to say, hey, what do you want us to do? They're already studying the problem. And the idea, the strategy is, and I've, I know that they've done this with other chemicals, you, you wear it out, and then when you figure out what the replacement is, you automatically drop it, and you don't get sued, and then you bring in the replacement. And quote, everybody wins, right? I get my lab funded for life, if I want, with more at the time. Literally, at the time, I was being paid $1,000 a day. That's not my research money. If I emailed Syngenta and said, hey, I thought about atrazine today, I'd get a check in the mail for $1,000. So imagine a young 25-year-old with two brand new kids, um, you know, scraping up money to try to do research, and you have all this available to you. And some people get sucked into that, and that becomes their careers. So, but they, they already knew about the aromatase induction and things. It, it was already in their notes. It was already public. They knew I would find it, but then they would have control over it. Um, but we'll alternate. So what are the current plans to get the public to know about the effects of atrazine? Like what you had said at near the end where it reminded you of your mother who doesn't have access to all of the scientific journals. What are your, I guess, plans to 
get this information to the public who doesn't have access to a lot of yes. the, these resources? I do everything I can. So I give any talk, public, private, how, any possibility. I've been in a number of documentary films, which gets out. There's a number of things available online. I used to maintain a website that made scientific literature summarized and available. I have testified before legislature. I've testified before EPA. I have pro bono assistant lawyers who were going after them for things. Um, everything I can. What makes the difference? I, I, what's the tipping point? I've worked with a lot of advocacy agencies, which I shied away from initially because you know I worried that oh I'm going to be you know affiliated or associated. Um, especially young, being young in my career, that, that was something I tried to avoid. I, I don't do that anymore. Um, and if you have other suggestions, you know, I'd probably be willing to do that too, as long as it were ethical and in line with information that I have available. Yes? First off, I'd just like to personally thank you for being here and sharing your research and letting us learn about this reality. Um, my question is, with the reality of who's in charge of the governmental agencies as of today, where do you think uh, the where do you think the duty of regulation uh, for food-based herbicides should be placed? Should it be placed in the private sector with those big companies and an internal research group, or should it be placed in the unbiased governmental agencies? You know, if I had a so part of the problem I understand is the EPA can't fund you to study an individual chemical because it becomes a conflict of interest that a regulatory agency is paying people to study chemicals for companies that they try to regulate. And they get, the EPA gets sued a lot, and they have to worry about that. Um, it, but to back up a little bit, I, I don't know that the agencies are all that different. Um, this stuff was happening in, in the administration that, well, I, I don't know what everybody's politics are, but this stuff was happening in another administration. I think in some ways, I think now it's at least transparent. At least now we know the EPA ain't gonna do nothing, pardon my English. The EPA ain't gonna do nothing. At least I mean, before, you had this false, because people also, for example, think like DDT was banned by EPA. DDT wasn't banned by EPA. DDT went out of use because insects became resistant, it became too expensive to use, and individual states started to regulate it, but it wasn't banned by EPA. And, and the EPA, the first thing, and, and you can go back and see this, it's publicly available. The first, when Obama appointed, and I forget her name now, Lisa, the head of the EPA that he, report, that he appointed in first term, the first thing she said publicly that she was gonna do is open investigation on atrazine. The, most of the data that has been available, at least mine, for 20 years, and that report was never issued by the EPA until after the administration ended because I believe there would probably be political impact. As I tell people all the time, it's not just about <coughs> atrazine and corn, it's now tied up in the renewable fuel ethanol thing. And the first presidential primary is where? Iowa, which, economy is based on, so you ain't going to go to Iowa and say, I'm going to point somebody to the EPA that's going to regulate the number one chemical. It's just, it's just not going to happen. So this administration and decisions with the EPA haven't shaken me that much because there wasn't a lot. I didn't have a lot of faith in them to begin with. Gotcha. No more to shake. So. Awesome. Thank you again. But at least now, at least, like I said with atrazine, the best thing about it is now we know. The best thing about the EPA now is now we know. I mean, and you see, how, how can you, with an agency that has a name like the Environmental Protection Agency, how can you say a monetary value? How can you say the decision is much bigger than science? Even if you thought that and said that in a room, how can you say that to a news outlet with a name like the Environmental Protection Agency? Again, that happened before, I assume you're talking about our current, uh, well, I'm not going to use the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so something that since I've gotten to undergrad has kind of really bothered me about research is it seems like whenever you have a project, you always have the, when you're trying to appeal to the public, you're always, people are asking the question, like, how does this affect me? Mm -hmm. And how does, you're constantly trying to make your research relate to the people and how it's affecting them. But as you said in your talk a little while ago, you're talking about like over three quarters of the amphibian biodiversity gone. Mm -hmm. And the effects on amphibians are so much more drastic than they are on us right now. And what about the frogs? Like you started out studying frogs because you love them, and obviously, like people are really important too, and there's some really serious implications. But like, we can't forget about the frogs. So I was just wondering, like, what's going to be done to try to help that? I, you know, so I try to present in 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 the way that I organize things 
The reason I organize this th things is wait, I know I sort of joke about it, but I try to, you know, like the Xenopus and the pregnancy tests, curiosity-based research, and so trying to get people to understand that you don't have to necessarily have a humanitarian goal. Who knows where me dipping frogs in hormones, who knows what's gonna cause me to end up here? Who knew about the pregnancy test? So that's the first thing, is that the biodiversity is important because there are many discoveries that nobody's even thinking about directly. Now, the second thing I, I try to point out to people is that even if you don't care about frogs, think about it, we're generating, we're creating an environment that animals that have been around since the dinosaurs are now in danger because of us, because of a single species. And that extinction rates right now are faster than they were in the last, you know, in the, in the extinction, mass extinction that took out the dinosaurs. And, and so I try to stress that to people. So even if you don't care, and I had some of these conversations here, even if you don't care about biodiversity, think about it. You're creating an environment. We depend on the water. We depend on air. Our air and water comes from the same place that theirs does. And we have similar physiology and development. That's why I start out with the gastrulation and neurulation. We're doing the same things based on the same genes and the same hormones. And so even if you don't care about frogs, then think about what they're telling us about ourselves and about and especially think about what it's telling us about the, the disenfranchised, the low income, the immigrants, and, 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 and the people that are essentially feeding us. If you can't have compassion for that, then, then probably you're somebody that I don't want to have a conversation with. So even though I didn't start out trying to do anything that was related to human health, I didn't even know I liked people. Until, <laughs> but then you realize that there's, a bigger, that there's a bigger thing and that every little thing we're doing in science contributes to that bigger, bigger thing, even if you don't see the direct connection. And I try to find ways to show people that. And, and what I've presented to you today is exactly the way my path went. I didn't sit down and go, hey, I want to study environmental justice and disparities in human health. Not, I mean, my, not at all. I never heard the word environmental justice until I met um, Keith Ellison, who's a, a congressperson in Minnesota, and he started talking about it. It's not anything I'd ever thought about. So that's the best you can do. And the people who can't see that, I guess, you know, I mean, I, you know, it's like, well, maybe I won't get into details, but sometimes there are people who are so far away from your perspective that you need to figure out better people and better ways to spend your time because you're not going to move anywhere with certain individuals. I think that's just a fact in some cases. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Hayes. Um, I'm a chemistry major myself. I'm also interested a lot in politics, so I often think about how there's such a discrepancy between um, the sort of the ideals of academia and academic research and sort of what, the, specifically in chemistry, but the actions and of a lot of chemical companies. Um, but of course, as you said, a lot of this comes from the companies, and you also said, you talked about how an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. How much of solving these types of issues do you think can come from changing the, co the corporate culture of these companies and their ethics, and how do you think that can be accomplished? I had great conversations about this with, this, with students at lunch today. I, I, think that, I don't think I'm being offensive, but I think if you are a corporate person, if, if you work in a corporation, if you're a banker, your, your job is to make money. And so behind, I don't think the problem is chemistry. I think the problem is the financial structure behind the chemistry. I think that if, if somehow in some ideal world, your goal as an agriculture worker, as a farmer, was to produce food. And, and if we developed an economic system that rewarded you for producing food, then I think we'd be in a, big, in, a, in a different situation. I have no idea how it is that six chemical companies, two of which aren't US companies, soon to be four, captured 90% of our seed. Like, how, why should that be? How did that ever happen? I, and and I'm not, I'm not, and, and again, I don't have a problem with GMO as a, as a, as a practice. I don't have a problem with even chemicals as long as you're you know, showing that they're safe and weighing out the costs and benefits. And, and certainly I don't have a problem with the agricultural industry, but how in the world did those three get intertwined in a way that, to me, there's a severe conflict of interest? Because you're like, why would I sell you corn seed if I know you can just save it back and then grow it yourself and not come back to me? I need you to come back to me. I do that by patenting my seed so that now you can't save it. And in most cases, it's suicide seed anyway. You can't replant it the next one. And then, because my real job is selling chemicals, I modify that seed in such a way that you also have to come back for me to get the chemicals. In this case, that's the problem. And I don't know how, or for that matter, how do you have a company that at the same time is selling pharmaceuticals and agrochemicals? 
there, there should be some kind of rule or law, and, and, you know, that, and, and I, think, I think you also asked, how do you pay for that research? Ideally, there should be some kind of tax or something that the chemical companies pay that goes into a pool and individual independent people apply for that money to do the research and report to nobody else except the government agency that regulates it. Because if the chemical company regulates it, which they do now, then there's a severe conflict of interest because they have an a, a, a investment in the outcome. So. Yes. One over here and then we'll go back over there. Um, your story is completely compelling and your, your numbers um, enthralling. Have you been able to reach out to citizen science across the states? You've done it around the world with professional scientists. Um, but for example, looking at that map from earlier where you had tracked where atrazine was present across the states and you had areas of without data. Um, have you been able to access or provide a platform for citizen scientists to be able to scan their water bottles or send them into you from their local pond and be able to add to your overall data set? Um, I have not, there, there, but there, in that case, but there's an extensive data set available. Uh, the USGS monitors it. You wouldn't be able to get access to it, but I co collaborated with the US Geological Survey and they did all of the measurements and there's a really extensive uh, map of, of usage and presence and contamination and, and all that that's available. I have not worked probably in the same framework that you're describing, but I've worked a great deal with local farmers and things. Because people would always ask, do the farmers meet you when you go to collect with a shotgun? But no. They would say, oh yeah, come on, you can do whatever you want. We know it's bad, but we don't have a choice. Absolutely. And ranchers now, though, ranchers will pull a shotgun on you. <laughs> yeah, but not farmers. We don't care about the dirt. We're caring about the animals on top. Um, I'm a rancher. Um, oh, also. okay. Well, I'm known how to stay away from here. <laughs> I, I've more than once had a rancher drive. Because you don't always know where the land starts and ends. And you're walking down a creek and all of a sudden... <laughs> you know, Absolutely. Like, <laughs> you got to watch out. Watch your step. Oh, yeah. Um, my second part of my question was going to be about, um, are there any, any folks at all implementing remediation of the ecosystems where atrazine specifically, in your case, um, has been infected, so by applying uh, estrogen blockers or anything to the water or handing it out to their field workers? Not, not to my knowledge. I, I know there are Do people who work in green chemistry who both try to design safer chemical alternatives and also there's, I know there's uh, people who try to work on things like chemicals for, you know, like the, uh, whatever the chemical is they use to clean up the oil spill. But then a lot of times you find out that the chemical they're using to clean up the oil spill is as bad or worse than the oil itself. So I know that there are people, not me, that work on things like that. Um, but I, I, I don't know if there's anything you know, ready to go to market yet, ready to be applied. Okay, thank you. Um, as you were uh, talking, I, start, I started thinking of the fact that I believe stats have come out recently that we are in the most segregated we've been since the 60s. Hmm. And with that coming in mind, I started thinking like, as you mentioned, atrazine mainly affects pop, um, populations of African Americans and Latinos. Well, not just atrazine, any, of the, any, atrazine. Of the, any chemical for that yeah. matter. And th that started to mirror um, the crisis in Flint. Yeah. And I was seeing like both of those seemed probably initially created this big burst of public outrage. And then they've rapidly seemed to fall from visibility to where you don't hear about it much anymore. Yeah. And my question is, do you think there's a possibility that it's connected with the fact that since society is so segregated, that the reason these issues are falling off the table is because the people who are in a position to make changes, in positions like economically and socially to change this, aren't connected to the people suffering? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I, can't, I, I, again, I don't want to give you a long answer, but I can give you examples of, I got asked to testify in Marin County in California, and it's, it's a very affluent Caucasian you know, white community, and it was about, it was a light brown apple moth which was threatening the economy of apples, I guess, and they wanted to fly over and drop pheromones to try to distract, my, harmless. But the idea that the plane was going to fly over and, and spray stuff and drop things was upsetting and they had a big hearing and I went, and, and Marin County is right next to one of those red counties I showed you and what I said was, I think this is harmless, but if you were raising all this noise now about people who are getting sprayed every day, then it would be a different story. Nobody would even think about flying over you, but because it's not impacting you, 
you know, you're not, yeah. I mean, so, 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 there, so, so there are a number of examples I can give you that are like that. If there were communities working together, um, but it's one of those things that until it hits your backyard, you, you're not really thinking about it. You're not really thinking about what the impact is. The other isolation is, I, I always give the example of my father who did floor covering and with sand and come home with his hair white and exposed to asbestosis, I mean exposed to asbestos. All of his uncle, all of my uncles, his uncles, died at age 40 from asbestosis. But being in that segregated community, I didn't, nobody knew that there was a health problem. We just knew like, oh, men die at 40. And so when you have an agricultural community that's isolated both by language, that's worried about um, deportation and all kinds of things, one, you're not going to complain, but there may not even be a recognition that there are problems, that there are health problems, because everybody in your community is the same. And you don't have very much contact outside of that community. So yes, that's absolutely a big part of the problem. Uh, thank you for doing this. Thank you. Okay, one last question. I'm too short. Um, <laughs> Hey. I, <laughs> you are too. You look like you've got about an inch on me, so. Well, it's my heel. <laughs> I, I am uh, beyond amazed and at what you've done. And we had the awesome questions from the students, like the ones, what are you doing and what can you do? And I immediately wondered, what can we do? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been uh, an environmentalist since UT, where I had professors. Um, in different departments, studied biology, liberal arts, I have a MPH, but I do everything I think I can. I sign all the petitions yeah. on Facebook and in the emails, I go to the protests, I write the letters, I argue with the friends. With all of your exposure, have you gotten any ideas that you could give us a call to action beyond the obvious? That some of us are I, I don't know if it's beyond the obvious. I, like, I never thought I would say things like, write your congressperson. Um, Already doing that, but. There is, and there is, EPA has, I mean, what that comment was in reference to is there's a public comment period on every pesticide that they review. And you don't, you don't have to be a scientist. You can just write in and give your opinion. Presumably, that makes some difference. Now, what actually pushes things to the limit that something actually happens? I don't know. I mean, I know that in Minnesota, every congressperson, I testified that every congressperson can tell you what aromatase is and what it does, et cetera. But when you have lobbyists, I mean, when I, you know, I've testified before in DC, but when I fly there once and then it's just me, they have a lobbyist that they're paying lots of money to be there every, 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 every day. And so every day they're hearing, this is what our constituents want. And then every now and then Tyrone says, well, here's this thing. But then they've got this other thing in their head. So, I, so well, but, but you have to keep pushing, and then hopefully something tips it over the edge. I'm wondering, I think everybody here being a student probably uh, subscribes to some of the emails from the environmental organizations and gets those requests to make a comment. And it's an effort. It's, yeah. I mean, if you're studying, if you've got a job, it's just a lot of work. But I, since I have a little audience here, I just want to encourage everybody to join me and do that because... Sometimes just a few of us screaming and trying to change the world isn't working, and we need to rally more people. I agree. And Thank you. Thank you very much again. Okay, now I'm tired. <laughs>